press. You remember that uh, they come with the many soldiers and they, uh, he asked them, who do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. And how did Jesus respond? Those last week, how did, what did they say? I am. And that was mindful of what? Yahweh went, well, and that's the point we made, that when uh, Moses asked uh, God, who shall I say sent me? He says, I am. I am. In other words, I am Yahweh. Yahweh, they don't really know how to translate it, except roughly means I exist. I am. And so Jesus perhaps is evoking God's covenant name here. And to support that, when he says that, they drew back and fell to the ground. And that's where we left off. Because when they come to arrest him with perhaps hundreds of soldiers with swords and, and they're expecting maybe resistance. When they ask who he is, and that invokes a question, like how did they not know who he was, but uh, by sight or by person, he volunteers, I am. And then when they fall down, I just want you to note something, that Jesus here is in charge of everything. Because when we look at these last events, there's some, several things that are going on. First of all, the disciples. Do you remember how uh, he began in chapter 14? With that long discussion with the disciples. He said, you believe in God, believe in me. He said, do not be uh, afraid. So we're going to see they're going to be dominated by fear and doubt and doubt because everything they thought they believed about Jesus is now going to be undermined right and then when it comes to Jesus himself we're going to see several words first of all I'm going to use the word love because when you ask why did he do all this the first word I hope comes to your mind is love love for you and then we're also see love for God but also with love we're going to see submission that He's doing this not because they are in charge, but he's submitting to the will of God. And so because of that, he's going to say, I, I have authority to lay down my life. We'll look at that text once again. He's in charge of all this thing. And so all these things are going on. And then when it comes to the Jews, what do you see? How would you describe their role in all this? Just off the top of your head. I'm sorry? Rejection. Rejection. Okay. Uh, is there justice in any of this trial or any of their accusations? No, it's just... Uh, go ahead, Clinton. They also had a situation where they knew if this, what Jesus is going to went forward, there's a good chance Rome would come and take their place away. Well, there might be some fear of that, exactly. So, but... They're just so unrighteous in everything, and we're going to point some of that out as we go through here. Uh, Alfred writes, of course, we don't know when they fell back. It's because there's a miracle or just his presence drops, you know, drops them down. Just like when God spoke from heaven, uh, the people fell to the earth in Exodus uh, 20. said, let God, you know, do, Moses, do, you go talk to him, because if he speaks anymore, we're afraid we're going to die. There's something amazing here. Look in John chapter 10, verse 18. It's on the board. We already looked at this before. He says, no one is taken away from me. Talking about his life. I lay it down on my own initiative. Now, we already read the verses. He said, I never do anything my, by my own initiative. Now, why would he say he's laying down his life by his own authority here? Well, because... I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up. This commandment I receive from my Father. So what is he saying here? No one's going to kill me and take my life from me. I'm going to willfully lay it down. And I have authority to do it. And that's because God commanded me to do that. And I'm submitting to him. I'm in charge of everything that's going on. And so I just want you to see that because we look at a lot of events here like, oh, it's terrible, it's terrible, it's terrible. Look what's happening. That's not fair. No, no. Jesus is in charge of all of it. And every time they beat him, who's in charge of what's going on? Jesus is. You say, well, that's cruel. But he is in charge. 
He knows what's going to happen. He's allowing it to happen. He's submitting to the will of God in this. And so it's, it's hard for me, you know, to wrap my arms around it. How could you be in charge and yet it'd be so cruel and you allow it to happen? Because it just seems so fair and so unjust. Now we're going to talk about his cup. And in this, I want you to think about our cries of injustice. We say so often, what? It's not fair. Why is this happening? And we're just going to have to remember that maybe I'm not in charge of what goes on around here, but the same Jesus who is in charge of this event is still the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, isn't he? He's in charge, and if he allows a cup for us to come to drink, no matter how unfair or cruel, can we drink it? Can we go through it? Absolutely. All right. Some, just some preliminary, preliminary thoughts before we look at it. All right. So, um, a couple of verses again, just to remind you, we've already saw in the book of John that chapter 5, this man who was healed did not know who Jesus was, but Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that faith, uh, place. This language is ambiguous. Sometimes it gives the idea that he slipped away in the crowd, but other times, when they're looking to kill him, and they could not find him, and he eluded them, it seems to be miraculous of sorts. But it, it's so ambiguous, it doesn't tell us. And what I mean by that is, look at chapter 7 and verse 30. They were seeking to seize him, and no man laid his hand on him. Well, why? If you're trying to kill him, well, because his hour has not yet come. Hmm, what does that mean? Uh, you look in verse 32 and 40 of that same chapter. I'll just take a peek because I want you to see that language. Uh, John 7 and verse 32. The Pharisees uh, heard the multitudes muttering these things about him, thinking that he was the Christ. The chief priests and the uh, Pharisees sent officers to seize him. So if you knew where he was and you're going to seize him, why would you come back empty-handed? So we read in verse 44, some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. In verse 45, the Pharisees, uh, the officers came back to the chief priests of the Pharisees and they said to him, why did you not bring him? And the officers answered, said, well, never did a man speak this way. And they said, well, you've not been led astray too. What's going on? Why would you disobey your authority it's just because you're listening to speak? Is there something more than just natural events? It's, it's hard to uh, put your finger on it, but I just want you to be sure who's in charge of everything that's going on. It's Jesus. His time is not coming. So they're wanting to kill him at this hour. It's not going to happen because who's in charge? God the Father and Jesus. He's in charge of what's happening here. So in chapter 8, therefore they picked up stones to throw him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Wait a second. He's there. They're going to stone him. And all of a sudden he hides himself. Now again, I don't know what's going on. But again, this is not his time because who's in charge? Well, Jesus, chapter 10, verse 39. They're seeking again to seize him and he eluded their grasp. Now, was he just quick, or was there just a lot of people? It doesn't tell us how it happened, but I know it doesn't matter because Jesus is in charge and his hour had not yet come. We have two other passages outside of John that will draw your attention to in Luke chapter 4. They got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill of the city, which had been built in order to throw him down off the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went his way. They drove him out. They're going to drive him over the cliff. But he just passed through their midst. And then Matthew 26. Jesus says, Do you not think I cannot appeal to my Father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. Now, what does that one tell us? I'm sorry, power? And is he submitting to what they are doing to him? Could he relieve himself of this death? Who's in charge? They think they're killing him, and that's not the case. He is allowing himself to be killed for a higher purpose. And I just want you to be just cognizant of that always. Yes. That's right. One angel. That's right. So 
He's in charge. So again, when we look at this in verse 14, chapter 14, verse 31, he said, so the world may know that I love the Father. I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Come up, let's go from here. I want you to think about this, that Jesus expressed his love for the Father by obeying the Father's command, specifically in this one, what? Go ahead and let yourself suffer and die for the people. And he goes in chapter 15 and verse 10 and says something else that I think is very curious. Uh, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, speaking to the disciples, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and I abide in his love. He continues in God's love and approval of him. Here's my son in whom I am well pleased. Why? Because he continually submitted to the will of the Father. Now, if you abide in God's love, what does that also suggest? You could what? I'm sorry? You could remove yourself from God's love by not submitting to his will. And so all this was is about love and submission. And we think, well, it was easy for Christ to go through this. Because, you know, he was the son of God. He was just on a task and no big deal. No, although he was a son, Hebrews chapter 5 or 6, he learned obedience. Now, that one just kind of blows me away. I really cannot explain it to you. That Jesus had to learn obedience while he was a man on this earth. He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So was it fun? No. Did he necessarily want to when it comes to his own will? No. Did he have to learn how to submit to the will of God when it was contrary to his own nature? Yes. Are you and I any different? No. And so next time you hear yourself whining, I don't want to, this is not fair, I want you to think of this. He went through the same thing. He had to learn obedience. And how do you learn obedience? By the things you suffer. I know how it went this Thanksgiving. When your wife was handing out the pie, and it was your first piece, would you like a piece of pie? Yes, thank you. And then when you asked for the second one, she said, okay. But when you asked the third one, <laughs> no. Is it easy to eat pie when you want to? Is that hard, or hard to do? But what if you're not allowed to or you're asked to do something you don't want to do? That's when you have to learn obedience. That's when suffering is when it gets tough to obey. When she says, try this pie and tell me that you like it. Okay, I'm glad to. Here, have another piece. And help and have another one. You know what we do to our guests? We just keep on throwing food at them. And they, they learn obedience by suffering. Oh, I'm not another piece. <laughs> I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. When it's easy to obey, you don't learn anything. Right? When is it difficult? Or when do you learn obedience? When what God asks of you is tough. That's when we grow up. That's when we become like Christ. So, the last one, Philippians 2.8. Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being, oh, coming obedient to the point of death. There is the degree in which he learned obedience. So, be sure. Who's in charge? Not the Pharisees. Not Pilate. Not the high priest, not Rome. Who's in charge of everything that's going down the next couple hours? Jesus Christ and the Father. And that's going to help us when we think of our own life here on this earth. So, again, they asked, who do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazareth. And he said, I told you I am he. Let these go their way. Uh, this, this is where we left off. And I want you to, again, see the language, I am. This time they don't fall down, Right? He repeats himself and said, I am. And so, again, it makes you think something was going on the first time that they fall down and fall back. This time they don't. You see this language, let these go their way. And that's to fulfill the command or the word that he said, I will not lose any that you have given to me. That's in John chapter 6, verse 19, and John 17 and verse 12 in his prayer. Um, it's interesting, let these go is in the imperative. 
He's not just saying, would you please let these people go? And as some of your translations use the word allow. That should, that's not a good translation. Uh, please allow these to go. He's telling the soldiers, I am. I told you I am. Now let these guys go. Who's in charge? All these men with all these, soldi- or these soldiers and all their uh, arms of weapons. And, and he's telling them, you let them go. Now, at this time, we find that Peter uh, is going to um, act. Now, what has Peter already promised? Help us. What has he already promised prior to this? I'll never deny you. And then what, how did he uh, answer, you know, uh, I'm sorry? Oh, well, he also, he, he upped the ante when he said, even if everyone else denies you, I won't. I'll even die for you. Do you think he meant that? Yes, he did. And I think you're going to see in this next action uh, some demonstration of that kind of commitment. So um, we're now in uh, verse uh, 9 or 10. So Simon Peter, therefore, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his ear, and the slave's name was Malchus. And then Jesus therefore said to Peter, Put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink of it? Now, so we're familiar with this uh, event, but Malchus is the high priest's slave's name, and some have indicated the only reason people are named by these people, it's because other Christians would know who they were. And so the suggestion is that this guy perhaps became a Christian later. And you could go interview and talk to him. And that's why uh, these individuals are identified by name. Because otherwise, why why give a name to him? Because there's going to be a servant girl that Peter denies Christ to. Her name's not given. So... uh, Here we have this guy named Malchus. Others have suggested, and it's just a speculation, to cut off his right ear. So if you stood up and I was going to cut your right ear, it's hard to do that. They say it's almost impossible. So they're saying that he sliced from behind and cut his ear off. And so that would be a cowardly act. uh, And it wasn't even a soldier. It was just a servant of the high priest. That's so speculative. And I'd rather just understand it this way. What's Peter doing? Protecting Protecting his master. You're not taking my master. Whoosh! The closest guy to him. And it was this man named Malchus. And Jesus said, whoa! No! You know, if that's the case, I could have my servants fighting. Put it away. And then he heals the man's ear. What does that leave Peter doing? Confused. Confused. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you mean? I already told you I'd die for you. And now I don't understand what's going on. You're going to let these people take you away? I've seen you calm the storm. I've seen you walk on the water. You've raised dead men from the grave. What are you doing letting these people lead you away? Can you imagine the doubt that might and the uncertainty and the confusion? What is going on? Is it merited? Absolutely. Now, as Jesus told them this event was going to happen, yes, did they understand it? No. So his confusion rests in that, not understanding. Of course, they weren't meant to understand this moment. So here we see that um, um, Peter really is acting on his commitment. And uh, even the other disciples, this, those around Jesus saw what was about to happen. They said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? So it wasn't just Peter, but Peter's the one that act. And here is this language that I mentioned earlier. He says to Peter, put the sword away into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Now, a cup, we think of a container, correct? But this cup is the one he prayed that would pass in the garden. So what cup is he speaking of? Not a physical container, 
but it's the anguish and the grief that that figurative container contains. So it's like, here the Lord is saying, here, I want you to complete this task. And you look in the cup, what is it? Betrayal, beating, shame, spit on, crucifixion, entering the Hadean realm. And so that's what he says when he says, the cup which the Father's given me, should I not consume it or am I going to reject it? So it's not wonderful language because each of us are given a cup from time and time to drink of. And it's really our choice if we're going to honor God and glorify Him by drinking that cup or say, no, I don't want anything of this. You know what I'm saying? Now that, trump might, uh, that cup that you were asked to drink might be some type of persecution on this earth. Uh, we just uh, talked about Travis Dillinger, who just last week finished his job with UPS because of uh, their discrimination against him by, because he was a Christian. And we talked about that generally. Did you guys hear about that? I won't go into it. Uh, it was very similar to Bill Downey's, uh, how he had lost his job. But it's interesting, uh, last week I just learned that Travis got a full-time work with its church at uh, South uh, Tacoma. And so maybe it's like the Lord says, I'm giving you this cup to drink, and I'm going to use it to transition you out of the secular world into the, what the job you wanted to do in the first place, you know, preaching the gospel. Uh, so it might be persecution. It might be rejection. It might be relationships falling apart. I don't know what it's going to be. It might be a health crisis. But God might give you a cup and says, I want you to suffer and see if you're going to learn obedience to me. And our choice is, are we going to drink of that cup or are we going to just deny Christ by saying, no, I don't have anything to do with it. That's what he's asking here. Uh, and so when you choose to drink the cup, who's in charge? Well, God who's asking to, but are you in charge or are the people doing the things to you, are they in charge? No, you're in charge. You're willfully submitting and saying, I'll take this on to the glory of God. So there's where we are. Now he's going to be taken to the high priest. Now, this can be confusing, and so we'll just give a quick outline. But um, verse 12, the Roman cohort and the commander and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. They led him to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. So, we're going to see that Annas is called the high priest, and Caiaphas is called the high priest. And so you're going to be left asking, who is the high priest? And so, we're going to first say, there's four trials that are mentioned, or five. Uh, first, Annas, then Caiaphas in the Sanhedrin council then to Pilate, then Herod, then back to Pilate. John's not going to deal with all those. And the first one he's going to deal with with his Annas. Now, he was a high priest from 87, seven years A.D., all the way up to A.D. 15, roughly, you know, 12 years, okay? Um, then Caiaphas, who is his uh, son-in-law, becomes high priest in eight. D18, he is the current high priest at this time because Annas was removed politically, but most people would regard him as the sitting high priest anyway. So you have one in name, but one, the, the power behind it is the father in law, Annas, all right? And so that's why Caiaphas is called high priest, but Annas still has the, the strings of the whole political regime here. So there's a passage in the Talmud, this is what Barclay writes, which says, Woe to the house of Annas, woe to the serpent's hiss. They are high priests, their sons and keepers of the treasury. Their sons-in-laws are guardians of the temple, and their servants beat the people with staves. Annas and his household were notorious. i just show you that quote. These were not nice people. They were in charge politically as well as religiously, and being in charge of the treasury is all about power and, and wealth, boy, has anything ever changed in our world? And so these are the people that are in charge of the, this religious system whom Jesus is going to have to stand before. Is anything going to be fair? No, not anything. But it doesn't matter because he's still in charge. 
It doesn't matter if it's fair because he's submitting to it. He's actually directing the process, isn't he? And they have no clue that's what's going on. So there's the background. Uh, Ananus and Caiaphas, or Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of the God came to the John, the sons of Zacharias in the wilderness. So here it mentions they're both being high priests. That's when Jesus was born. So that would actually be in this time period right here. So Annas, but here it says they both were. So actually they have found the uh, um, tomb, or actually the bone box, uh, of uh, Caiaphas in 1990 when they were digging a foundation in Jerusalem and they found this tomb and there were several ossuaries and one of them was the one for Caiaphas and there was like five uh, bodies in there, bones of five bodies. One, uh, three children, a couple youths and a 60-year-old man. And they understand Caiaphas uh, died when he was age 60 so re- it was a really ornate one. This is in the museum. You can see it. So they think that's his. It said Caiaphas on it. So they think this is the high priest's uh, bone box. And all that does is can confirm that this man was a real man that lived at this time. And these aren't just made up stories. That's really powerful. All right. So but back to our, uh, the events at hand. So the Roman court and the commander, they take him to Annas first. He's a father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year. Now, it was Caiaphas had advised the Jews earlier in John 11 that it was expedient for someone to die on behalf of the people. Remember that? He said, let's be careful. Did they already predetermine what was going to happen to Jesus? Is there going to be justice here? No, we've got to kill someone. So just hang in there. We'll get this done. And so that's what's going to be happening here. Annas was the power, Barclay writes, behind the throne in Jerusalem. Four of his sons had also held the high priesthood, and Caiaphas was his son-in-law. But Annas is the man that's ruling all this. All right, so Simon Peter, Peter, we're going to just turn our attention to him. So Jesus is bound before Annas, and here Peter follows, and who's following with him? What does it say? Another disciple. Who is this another disciple? Now, how do you know it's John? Who said that? Oh, you're pointing your feet. Oh, wait, you're throwing her under the bus. Okay, it was Rochelle. Where'd it go? <laughs> the best understanding, because we see this language in the book of John more than once. The disciple whom Jesus loved. You know, was closest to him, had his head on his chest around the table. Uh, it's in Jap- chapter 20. It's best understood this is John's reference to himself. Rather than name himself, it's just the disciple Jesus loved or another disciple. So unnamed, but perhaps most best understood to be Peter and John. Okay? So this disciple is known to the high priest, this one. So that's interesting. There's a connection between John's family and the high priestly family. And that's why perhaps the servant knew who John was. Okay? So when he entered with Jesus in the court of the high priest, but Peter was standing at the door side. So he goes inside, but Peter stays on the outside. The other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. So he's got some kind of relationship. Some said, well, maybe they sold fish to the high priest because they were fishermen, right? I don't know. It's just interesting. Um, It's interesting. Peter and John are both going to end up denying Christ, aren't they? We're only going to concentrate on Peter because he is the one that said, no way, I'll never deny you. And Jesus said three times. But did John deny him? Did he run too? It's these two that after the resurrection, are arrested by the same Jews and taken before Caiaphas, Peter and John, and they said, we order you not to preach in the name of Jesus anymore. Now, one time they're going to deny him. Next time, in front of the same people, they're going to say, no way. You can beat us. You can kill us. But we cannot stop speaking in the name of Christ because there's no other name given under heaven by which man must be saved. Have they changed? Yeah. Before, they're out of control. 
in this time, they're in control of their life on this earth in submission to God. See the difference? When you're out of control, you deny. When you're submission to Jesus and you learn obedience by the things suffered, then there's not anything man can do to you. So we see what happens then. The slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are not also one of the man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Is that just kind of a casual denial? You're a disciple of Christ. No, I'm not. It's more emphatic when he puts the word I in the Greek, but he said, no, not me. But he's trying to avoid detection, even though he wants to be close to see what happens to his master. Now, the slaves and officer were standing there, having made a charcoal fire. It was cold. They were warming themselves. And Peter was also with them and standing and warming himself. Here's his first denial, though. Now, they're going to intensify as they go. So this servant girl presumably knew the other disciple, as we mentioned. And so she's thinking, another disciple. Okay? Uh, it goes on now. The high priest, back to Jesus and the high priest. And we're in verse 19. So the high priest therefore questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Now, why is that important? His disciples and his teaching. Why the disciples? So they can gather them up. That's exactly right. Now, what did Jesus just pray in chapter 17, just the chapter before? About the disciples. Protect them. They're not of this world even though they're in the world. And he's also, it was his charge by God that all that God has given to him, that he lose none of them. And that's why he said in the, in the garden, let them go. He ordered them, let the disciples go. And now the high priest went, so tell us who your disciples are. You think he's going to give in to this? No, because he has to protect them. That's his commandment. That's what he's responsible for. That was his prayer. So you think he's going to betray them like they are going to betray him? No. So Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews came together, and I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I've spoke to them. Behold, these know what I said. Now, this is a roundabout way of saying, you can't ask me to testify against myself. Isn't that what they're doing? You tell us about what you're teaching about your disciples. No. If there are accusations, their law demanded your accusers are to be brought forward, and they are supposed to make accusations against you. They're, they have no accusers at this point, and they're asking for Jesus to to accuse himself by his own uh, comments. So he refuses to do that. Now, did he speak openly? Yes. It's interesting. That which is spoken in light, darkness has no ability to comprehend or overcome. And when you speak the truth, that would, those that hold to lies, they have no power over you. They, they can't battle you. They can't, they can't reason with you because, well, truth always wins out, doesn't it? So what's the only option they have left when you speak the truth? What's the only option if they can't reason with you? Destroy you, right? To persecute you, to silence you. And that's what they're going to do is they're going to kill him because they have no way to deal with what he has to say. So he says, um, um, you send in the accusers. So when he had, heard, had said this, one of the officers standing nearby struck Jesus saying, is this the way you should answer the high priest? Because they took it as offensive. <laughs> Would you want to be the man that struck Jesus? I mean, think about that. You just struck the creator of the heavens and the earth. You just hit the one who was in the beginning with God and who was God. You just hit the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. You just struck the one that you're going to fall before and confess his name and have to give account for your actions done in the flesh. And one of those things you're going to have to give account for is, why did you hit Jesus? Would you want to be this man? Man, I've never thought of it and just until I was just thinking about it this week again. And, 
But yet, do we do that many times our own way? Maybe not literally hitting Jesus, but by our language and by our anguish, our actions, we strike at him. Uh, but that's really grievous, isn't it? Jesus answered said, if I've spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. Just tell me what I did wrong. But if rightly, why are you hitting me? See, they're the ones that are being unjust here by wrongly uh, striking him. So Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, high priest. And we're not given the full story of everything goes on. It's just John's purpose is just to give an outline here. So now we're back to who? Peter. All right, what, where did we leave Peter? He is warming himself. So now there's a, this would be a great movie, right? You just transition over to another scene. He was standing, warming himself. They said to him, you're not also one of his disciples. And he denied it and said, I am not. Then one of the slaves, the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off. See the connection? Malchus said, this guy named Peter, he cut my ear off. And obviously he knew what he looked like. And so he said, did I not see you in the garden with him? So he was there, right? So here's Peter's third opportunity to confess Christ, right? And honor his commitment, I'll even die with you. It's interesting, the I is emphatic in the original. Did I not see you? I saw you. I know you were there. And what does Peter say? He denied it again. Now, we know in Matthew's account that he cursed or took an oath. You know, by the name of God, I know not the man. And But John leaves that part out. And immediately what happens? The rooster crows. We know Luke's account. What does Jesus do right then? Looks at him, and they connect eyes. And Peter went out and wept uh, bitterly. But... It fulfills in what Jesus had said would happen to him in John 13, 38. Okay, any questions right there? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sure. Fear a little bit better than you're walking into right. a very dangerous situation. Yeah, that's a fear. And when you have that fear coupled with the confusion that is obviously reigning in Peter's mind, like, what's going on here? I, I thought he was going to be king. And now they're being led away. Yes, when you put those two together, it's very understandable, right? Um, and your suggestion would be easy for us to do the same. Yeah. So now the rest of the chapter is before Pilate. And we don't have time to go through all of it, but I think we can get a good start on it. So here it said of Pilate, he was a weak man who tried to cover up his weakness by a show of obstiny, uh, obstinate, obstinacy, and violence. His period of office was marked by several savage outbreaks of bloodshed. We could go into the history of that. He was just a cruel man. And the only reason he was uh, uh, a governor in this area is because of some political events that took place in a marriage. So they led him to uh, Caiaphas into the Praetorium, and it was early. They did not enter the Praetorium, so they would not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. But Pilate went out to them, said, what is your accusation? Then he's going to take Jesus into the praetorium. That's probably by Antonio's fortress where the Roman soldiers were and the uh, temple guards were. I want you to see the hypocrisy, though. Why didn't they go into the praetorium? It says. Why? They didn't want to defile themselves. Why? Because it's a Roman unclean area. Why? It says, if you're unclean, you can't eat the Passover because you had to be clean and there wasn't time enough to go through purification to eat the Passover because what's going on this week? The Passover. Are they observing the little rules of the law right here? 
that's unclean. We can't go in there because if we get unclean, we can't eat the Passover. They're following the little rituals, and they're important, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, what are they doing? They're unjustly going to murder a man who's innocent, who is their prophesied Messiah. Can you see the hypocrisy? We can't go in there. But kill this man. Isn't that something? Just something pointed out to us there. That's why that verse is there. So Pilate wants to know, what is the charge? And uh, they're going to say very quickly, uh, if this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. <laughs> Isn't that quite a charge? He said, you just not got to trust us. We would like to kill him, but we can't do it on our own. And so just the fact that we're here, you know the man's guilty. They're asking Pilate to trust them. That's how evil these people were. Now, they had to use the Roman government. And if there were times when they went outside the law and killed people on their own, and they usually stoned them when they did that. It was a spontaneous thing, and they just stoned the individual. Did they try to do that to Jesus? And they'd have to deal with the, the aftermath later. Here they're trying to go through it, the courts legally, but not legal at all. So Pilate said to him, well, take him yourself and judge him according to your law. He wants nothing to do with it. And so they come back and say, well, we're not permitted. That means we have no authority to. That's exactly what they're saying here. To put anyone to death. So we want you to do it for us. Now, they spoke this to fulfill the word of Jesus, which he spoke signifying what kind of death he was about to die. All right? Now, so Pilate takes them into the praetorium. So they're outside. This is a private thing well, without these uh, uh, Pharisees. And he summoned Jesus and asked him simply, are you the king of the Jews? Why did he ask that? Because I forgot to make comment of Luke 23. They began to accuse him at this time, saying, well... He's calling himself a king, asking people, don't pay taxes. Now, will that get Pilate's attention? Yes, this guy, my guy might be an insurrectionist, right? These are false charges about not paying taxes. Actually, he said the opposite, didn't he? But did Jesus claim to be a king? Yeah. So Pilate comes in, and the first thing he asks him is, John records, are you the king? And Jesus said, well... Are you figuring this out on your own, or did others tell you about me? And Pilate comes back strongly and says, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and chief priests delivered you up. To what, what have you done? And so again, Jesus answered. And this is an interesting response, because it's really a response in the affirmative. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews, but as it is, my kingdom's not of this world. My question for you, who's in charge? Jesus said, if I wanted to put an end to this right now, all I had to do is say the word, and my servants would be fighting. Whose servants, which servants is he speaking of? Ah, it's not necessarily his disciples, but it's all the angels that are his charge and will be sent out just like that. You know, that legions of angels. But as it is, my kingdom's not of this world. Who's in charge of everything that's going down? Jesus Christ. Um, a couple of things that will be done, because we're out of time. In John 17, verse 16, Jesus said this of the twelve. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Not of the world. Even though they're in the world, they're not of the world. Right? Jesus said that of himself, I'm here, but I'm not of this worldly order. Now he's using that exact same language for the kingdom. In the Greek, it's exactly the same. The kingdom is what? Not of this world, even though it's in this world. So what does that mean? Next week, we'll explain that. All right? Not of this world. Thank you very much.